Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Inclusive Leadership from Why to How digital event hosted by the CMI Southeast Regional Board. My name's Jamil, and I'm a regional manager here at CMI, and I'll shortly be handing over to Steve to begin this evening's event. If you have any questions during the session, you can ask them using the live chat on the right of your screen, and we shall answer as many as we can. Today's session is being recorded and will be shared with you tomorrow for those who book to attend. And it will also be available on the CMI website and also on the CMI YouTube channel. So now over to Steve Duncan, Deputy Chair of the CMI Southeast Regional Board. Good evening, Jamil. Um, thank you and welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by uh, Ritu Kansal, Senior Project Manager at the University of London, and Mr. Dean Bellman, Operations Director for MACE Defence Consulting and the Director of the Positive Mental Health Programme, Front of Mind, as we discuss inclusive leadership. Before we begin, though, I'd just like... Um, to ask everyone to take a moment and reflect as we um, consider World Holocaust Memorial Day um, and ask you as we move forward um, to take your place as one of the candles in the darkness. So uh, building on our previous event, uh, in which we hopefully convinced you of uh, why we should be involved in uh, inclusive leadership. Uh, the question now is, how can we make it happen? Um, so uh, we've got two very uh, talented speakers here with us tonight, um, and therefore they're more than capable with Dean and, uh, being put on the spot. So if I could um, start myself, Ritu, and if you could just briefly give us an overview uh, of... Um, what are you going to discuss tonight and how we're going to turn that dial? Absolutely, Absolutely. Steve. Thank you so much. So um, raising awareness and getting people on board has relatively been an easier or straightforward thing to do. But now, uh, reflecting on the why to how, uh, one of the things that's evident is that it's an ongoing process. And one of the reasons uh, the how can be so challenging is that we don't have the vocabulary for it. So that's one of the things we will be touching on today. And uh, we, would all, we will also be talking about the tangible ways forward, which include identifying actionable, bite-sized, doable items that could create changes or habits for example, around hiring practices, mentoring and training, this can really make a difference. Thank you very much for that, Rita. And uh, to yourself, please. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, I, I, I think I lost a bit of connection there. But um, so the practical why to how, what I'd like to do is just pick up where we left off the first session where we were talking about the why. Um, and I remember saying towards the end of that, that it's it's not enough for leaders and managers, and indeed all of us, to just be advocates. We need to move to become champions. Um, so that's the first step in moving from why to how. It's not good enough just to say, yes, we agree with it. We need to proactively um, represent it and become champions for it. And as Ritu alludes to, that, that means finding ways to build strategies and techniques that we'll touch on in today's, in today's talk into the organization's routines, into its processes, maybe even into its policy. Um, fantastic, Dean, and, and really pleased to hear you use the word champions there, um, because one of the things that I'm quite passionate about is not just that we champion individuals, but we enable those individuals to have the confidence to be their own champion. Um, and that's where we're really starting to move somewhere with inclusivity. So um, I can see that we've got people uh, tuning in from us as far away as Brighton uh, and Texas and California. Um, but what I'd like to, to do just to, to provide some kind of format to, to the event is um, we've already had some questions come in and I'd like to take the first and use it as a bit of a case study for you to apply your techniques, your, your house to. Um, so the, the question is, how do you begin to influence senior managers to take diversity and inclusivity seriously if possibly you're the only person of a particular group within the organisation? Um, 
and maybe new or junior within it. Um, so if I could offer that to you first, please, Dean. Okay, absolutely. So um, I think, and, and Rita will probably talk more here about, about the evidence case behind things and building the evidence and, and the statistics, but it's uh, you kind of introduce it by saying by way of a case study. So the more you can present it to your leaders and your managers as, look, if we if we actually engage with this proactively and positively, as opposed to just responsively, then, then we can start to reap the dividends of, of building a, a proactive engagement. So what do I mean by that? Um, start to tell the stories to show how some of the leading organizations use techniques such as leveler exercises at the start of meetings so that no one feels isolated. Everyone does the same exercise. Just give up the first meeting, the first minute of a, of a meeting, a full team meeting on a Monday and use a leveler exercise. And that means that everyone starts the meeting then at that same level. Um, and then during the meeting, build in force multiplier exercises where, you know, we can proactively build in the ideas from various different people and groups. Um, yeah, and, and just on that point, um, Dino, I know that the last time we spoke on this, um, you had a, an interesting little how for us all in our um, mobile phone obsessed uh, stages. I wondered if perhaps you'd, you'd like to share as a start. Uh, maybe we could even do it, you know. Um, so as you can see, front of mind, one of the things I passionately believe in is positive mental health. But a lot of the strategies and techniques that we promote for positive mental health actually have the, the knock on effect or the, or the, the, the secondary effect of, of fueling the brain in terms of creativity, collaboration, communication. And one of the exercises we use at a lot of the start of sessions, which is a great leveler exercise, because um, everyone will have arrived, various different grades in the organization will have arrived at the Monday morning meeting or the, or the scrum or whatever it is, um, and just say, right, everyone, could you all take out your phones, please? So um, how about the people at home? Well, why not try it? How about if you take out your mobile phone now and just take 20 seconds, 30 seconds to send a positive message to someone who's not expecting to hear from you? Um, could be any kind of positive message, just a nice message to someone. But the critical thing in this one particularly is that they're not expecting to hear from you. Um, it's going to be nice for you. Uh, you're going to feel good for it. You're going to release some, some dopamine, some oxytocin, some serotonin, maybe some endorphin hormones, which are going to make you feel good. Um, but, um, but equally, that person that receives it, well done, Steve. Um, <laughs> you're, hopefully, you're going to bring a smile to their face. And who knows what you might achieve one day. And then imagine that happening at the start of a meeting. Everyone now puts their phone down. Everyone's just conducted, completed the same exercise. Everyone's got a little shot of, you know, good hormone in their brain. Everyone's feeling good. Everyone's just done the same thing. We've leveled everyone. OK, so it's a, it's a great position to move forward now because everyone feels an equal position in the meeting. Fantastic, Dean. Thanks a lot for that. And and if you have just sent a um, text message uh, to someone, please come up in the chat comments and, and let us know um, how that played out. Um, OK, so Ritu, um, over to you. The, this question, how do you get these people to buy in? Well, definitely, I, I very much like the idea of creating the level playing field and, you know, something that supports a positive culture within the organization. And I think it is really important to be constructive solutions oriented. And um, one of the things um, I think works really well is to, to measure things. So as Dean mentioned, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I talk about getting statistics. So get clear, get statistics and uh, get it on the agenda. And another thing that uh, I think is really helpful is, so if you look at Pearson's law, uh, it says, if you measure performance, you have improvements. If you measure performance and report it, you have improvements exponentialized. So what I'm getting at is uh, whether or not you have a formal uh, forum where you can report something, start a conversation and uh, take it somewhere, uh, find a champion or an ally. Um, and you don't have to label allies as allies in the first instance, but uh, find people who you can have a conversation with. And definitely uh, 
get empirical information and really uh, communicate the intent with which uh, you know you're coming with uh, you know when you measure something and uh, that intent to support the organization's mission so when I say get clear get clear with your intention get clear on where's your organization headed you know what's the mission and how are you supporting your organization through initiatives that uh, also support inclusion? Yeah, um, fantastic there, Rita, and, and nice there with um, Pearson's law that, that if we can provide hard empirical evidence, mm. then it becomes hard for people to argue. Um, and as any organization, you know, uh, we shouldn't just have policies to leave them sitting in a drawer. Um, if we've gone to the effort of creating them, we have to assume that that there was a reason behind that um, and then make sure that, that they're doing uh, what it is that we wanted them to do. Um, some comments already coming in on, on the initial link. Um, exercise. That's good to see. Um, it, it does remind me also of, of one of the things from David Marquette, uh, guide to creating uh, inclusive and effective leadership. Mm. Um, and he says, um, the more you talk, the less you're listening. So if you actually want to hear what your people think, if you actually want to know what's going on inside the heads of these, you know, these marvellous brains that you're paying a lot of money to have, um, you need to talk less, but the, the sequence has to be you talk less first, then they talk more, not you wait for them to talk more and then you'll talk less. Because um, funny old thing, the whole time you're talking, they'll be quiet. <laughs> and and on cue, Steve. <laughs> no, Steve, you're absolutely right. David Marquette, you know, um, it, it, it's a great book. It's a great text, you know, to turn the boat around um, and really exemplifies uh, empowerment and, and how to create the conditions. So I guess what I'd say, moving on from the, what we said in question, in that first initial question about, you know, how can you do it? Um, what you'll see the, the great organizations doing is they will use the, the existing behaviors of good leadership, good management, where good leaders and management managers will proactively seek to create positive relationships. What do I mean by that? Where people feel that what they think and what they do matters. Um, and they will build those relationships in positive environments where, where people feel, um, and we had a great discussion actually as part of the CMI, didn't we, with one of the, the, the team in, in actually on this today in, in the sort of back room enabling this, Jez, who said, maybe we should be thinking not just of creating environments of inclusivity, but let's take it a step further. And I really like that, in environments of belonging, because you, you can be included, but not really feel like you belong. Yeah. So great managers, great leaders will seek to create positive relationships and positive environments where those people really feel that they belong. They matter. They are of value. If you want to add rocket fuel to that, or if you want to turn that into rocket fuel, you then proactively structure those teams that have positive relationships in positive environments with people of cognitive diversity. And that cognitive diversity might come from cultural background, it might come from race background, it might come from sexuality background, it might come from a whole host of different life experiences that have enabled them to achieve their way of thinking. But that cognitive diversity multiplied by the positive relationships and positive environments that the leaders and managers in an organization are creating is absolute rocket fuel. Absolutely. And can you imagine when all, all your people, when the organization bring all of themselves to the organization, can you imagine the quality of your talent pool? You know, we bring our experiences to work. And if an organization values those experiences, absolutely. Uh, you know, the analogy of the rocket fuel, uh, you know, uh, totally fits uh, in that respect and um, listening um, is so so important I'm, I'm so glad Steve you mentioned that and of course uh, Dean you know you, you've uh, very well exemplified how that can help and uh, you really make your people feel 
valued and uh, it is a, a very positive environment to work in and uh, your productivity is going to go uh, through the roof you know if if you are actually nurturing that kind of culture that kind of environment and then any policies you create would be from that space of uh, you know positivity and that constructive mindset and you would be looking at keeping your policies not in a drawer but keeping them really current underpinned by your mission or what you're looking to achieve yeah then you know brilliant there as you, as you say you you're paying for all this diversity you're paying for this mm. cognitive diversity it's then up to you whether you leave it sitting on the bench or you bring it into play either way it's it's costing you the same so you know there's a huge benefit there for, for no extra expense which surely is a key fundamental of business um I, I think there's even a greater cost than than it just costing you the same mm -hmm. steve i think you know the opportunity cost that is lost when we don't when we don't fully develop the potential in the people that we recruit i don't know of any organization that goes out and just says right i just want a fairly bland recruiting campaign please just want some people who are just going to you know join the bench and not really rock the boat you know we <laughs> someone made an analogy to me a while ago and i love it said you know we go out and we recruit for jedis we recruit for luke skywalker and then after two months in the organization we're surprised when they've turned to the dark side um, <laughs> and it's because we get them in and then, and then we, we you know the first idea they come up with they say oh we've tried that before oh well if we're talking about making making people feel that what they think and what they do matters which is a key fundamental mm -hmm. of inclusivity then we, we can't afford to make those people feel like that you know we, we we're going to turn them to the dark side and we've just gone to all the trouble of recruiting them so um for their cognitive diversity yeah. and having recruited and trained them if we treat them like they don't belong we shouldn't be surprised if they choose not to belong <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually so, sometimes that belonging uh you do have to take some um uh, you know, really uh, thought through steps to actually achieve that. So, for example, if if the culture of the organization is already a bit awry and, you know, you it hasn't actually been uh, something, you know, that's been nurtured right from the start, then I would say it's also okay to get a bit uncomfortable when you are trying to make progress towards, uh, you know, making your culture more conducive to a more belonging culture. And so uh, I think the analogy of uh, maybe a gymnast, you know, here, uh, you know, where, you know, you, you train and that training can be really uncomfortable. And, you know, every muscle in your body hurts. I'm not saying, you know, the inclusion journey has to be that hard. <laughs> but when you experience that discomfort, it is actually a sign of progress. So uh, a reasonable amount of discomfort is actually very healthy. And, and uh, I don't think we will touch on the entire, you know, um, uh, the, the levels of discomfort, you know, we could touch on within these, you know, I don't know 20 minutes or so we've got left. But um, I, I think and I hope that you understand what, what I'm getting at, that it's OK to have those conversations. Uh, things can feel a bit uh, challenging sometimes, but that's OK. Rita, I'll uh, just pick up on that. The, um, you know, I think we said in a previous chat, but, you know, the, <laughs> I use a lot of analogies, metaphors, but the lobster has to feel uncomfortable in its shell Absolutely. in order to shed its shell to then grow. It's That's, it's yeah. we should we should, we should embrace. it's the very feeling of you know feeling uncomfortable that initiates the growth that initiates the the change that enables the growth. So embrace it. And and sometimes uh, feeling uncomfortable could also be a sign that something is not quite right, and that could be your uh, trigger to uh, look at things and then to do something about it. So in that respect, it's actually a really good thing to be very aware of how you are feeling about a situation and environment culture 
Yeah, I mean, it, it can be um, very easy to give ourselves a pat on the back and say we're very enlightened and we have no no problems. It's only when we actually look a little bit further when perhaps we, we shine that candle and we have to face up to the fact that perhaps we're, we're not quite where we could be or should be or would like to be. Um, so I don't know, Dino, have you, uh, you know, Ritu's obviously brought up this issue of um, having to be prepared to, to ask difficult and uncomfortable questions. Um, if you've got any, any perhaps advice or guidance for people. Um, well, as we said in the, in the previous webinar, once once we get in into our mindset and we we fully accept that in perhaps the vast majority of situations questions are the answer mm -hmm. then we come and we become more comfortable with how we use those questions sometimes it's a necessary question that we have to ask to understand a situation but sometimes it's simple as going to the person and saying look i, I don't know i i don't know what questions to ask at the moment can you help me can you let me know what I can be asking you in order to help you, what I can be doing? And indeed, that display of vulnerability will, in, in all my experiences, serve to build trust, build strength in the relationship, and, and deepen the, the inclusivity or the belonging that that person feels into your team or into the team. So, yeah, I think don't be frightened to not have the answer. There's a a lot of managers and leaders feel a tremendous pressure to have the answer that you can create some of the most inclusive environments or feelings of belonging environments with with truly diverse teams if you are if you are if you are able to present yourself as someone who doesn't have the answers and that's the very reason you've assembled those people in that team with that cognitive diversity um, that would be my take on it I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely agree, Dean. And actually, uh, if you give somebody all the answers, assuming you actually think you've got all the answers, but I don't think you do, um, you know, <laughs> you are actually uh, uh, taking away the opportunity for for the person to grow, but also, you know, uh, for for you to grow. And what better way to empower someone? you know, to really empower your people to develop, to grow and to make a, a meaningful contribution uh, to the organization uh, by, by uh, inspiring them to ask the questions and maybe find the answers. And sometimes you cannot answer everything what's going on for a person. They do need to figure it out uh, for themselves. And I think um, I, I noticed that somebody in the audience has asked about, you know, listening for, uh, you know, understanding or listening for responding. I think this sort of, uh, also touches on that where, you know, when you're listening, you might be listening to, to enable the right questions to be asked. So a lot of it is about understanding and it is, not always about responding. So I don't think we should be rushing to respond to something or as leaders feel uh, obliged or compelled to respond to everything. I would always say, take your time. Yeah, and I, I think a good, a good point there in that, um, you know, part of developing and people growing is them working through problems for themselves as you say not giving them the answer but giving them the support that they need on their journey towards towards that answer um so just um moving along we've we've got plenty of questions coming in um but uh, uh one of the ones that we've had is um how can we help people to understand that simply appointing someone from a minority of any sort is not the answer to the problem. And and Rito, if, if you wouldn't mind opening on that one. Sure. So I think to me, the biggest distinction is um, uh, between diversity and inclusion. And I think uh, 
one one of the things uh, around the language we use in inclusion terms uh we do uh use diversity and inclusion interchangeably which is not accurate so diversity is you know you you've got uh, uh you know you you've ticked your boxes you've recruited a, a person from um a, a couple of ethnic minorities from uh you know you've uh, recruited a couple of uh people from different uh, sexual orientations and gender but that's that's diversity what are you really doing to uh make your people feel included now we touched on policies now policies on paper are no good if they don't yield any results so i think it's really important to uh measure and again coming back to uh the point about having the answers you may not actually know uh what the exact steps are for you to achieve uh inclusion and that level of belonging within the organization so it's really important to keep measuring your performance uh within the organization and ask you know people do they actually feel uh as part of the fabric of the organization do they actually feel they belong do they actually all feel at par do you know anything from you to add to that i'd i'd like to echo ritu's comments and and add to one part of it if i may which is ritu mentions policies so look virtually every organization in the world has had to take a long hard look at a few of its policies in the last 12 months okay we've in may we've had to look at our policies for working at home and i imagine every organization has in front of mind we're looking at how we can change to 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 adapt to the way people are working at home so have a look at your policy for diversity equality inclusivity and just ask yourself does that policy appear to exist as a protective mechanism as a reactive and protective mechanism or is your policy truly trying to be generative is it trying to look beyond and forward and outside the organization you mentioned david marquette earlier steve don't look at the challenges in the and that you're experiencing in the organization in the submarine look outside be generative look beyond the walls of your experience at this moment in time learn from the organize learn from the the industries that do this the flight safety industry when there's an when there's an aviation incident um the flight safety investigation branch will expose every single detail they can and then publicize it for open view to the world because they want everyone to learn from it and that's a generative culture so whilst you whilst you've got your your policy pen in your hand because we've all had to have our policy pens out over the last few months have a look at your your e&d or your your diversity and inclusivity um and equality policy and just say are we are we chasing box ticking and reactive protective policy here or are we chasing generative development absolutely and uh, your policy absolutely agree dean and policies uh steve i mean they are live documents they are organic and i like the word dean used you know they are generative so uh you've heard me say this before you know ask yourself you know is this a record of the past or is this a map for the future yeah and and as we discussed before um you know um inclusivity is is the future it's is the way ahead so you have a simple choice um you can be part <laughs> of the future or you can be part of history um you can't be both um for myself as an nlp practitioner you know i look at this question and i i turn it on its head and quite simply say well um you tell me why it's not the answer uh and when you can tell me why having greater diversity and greater inclusivity and recruiting this individual isn't good we'll we'll carry on the discussion i expect it will be um fairly sure no absolutely and it's the same approach we take in a lot of the positive mental health work when we're trying to unlock the understanding and the mindset that we should be investing in our positive mental health and the positive mental health of those around us in the same way we invest in physical health it's just a paradigm of health 
can be negative, can be positive, same as physical health. And we have we have a variety of different strategies, techniques, habits, routines that we undertake on a daily, weekly basis to build and protect our, our physical health. We brush our teeth, we shower, we control what we eat, we exercise. We, and when you say to someone, how many of these do you have for your positive mental health? How many proactive daily habits, routines do you have? They say, oh, not many really. And, they say, and then they say, why should I have them? Well, no, why, why shouldn't you? <laughs> why shouldn't you have them? And it's again, it's taking that NLP, re reversing, the, reversing the equation. Fantastic. Um, I know that you're full of good ideas, Dean. Um, <laughs> so again, we're looking looking to you for another. Have you got any other um, short and sharp uh, techniques that we we might be able to apply uh, to get yeah, us so into this power space? Let's go for another one that's both uh, can be used as a leveler exercise in a meeting and also as a force multiplier. What do I mean by a force multiplier? It's something that's going to get the, the creative um, hormones, um, chemicals flowing, but also it might, in the process of it, unlock some ideas from someone who maybe wasn't feeling confident enough to, to put them forward. So at the start of a meeting, I challenge you to open the meeting the day before with an email that says, the first five minutes of this next meeting three people in the group will be asked to put forward something really really positive that we can learn from that's happened in the last two weeks and what they think we can learn from it and or something positive that is going to or could happen in the next two weeks and how we can move towards securing it happening and it will be an introduction of a, of a, of a chat and it'll only be a two minute chat and we'll do two maybe three of these everyone has to do that cognitive thinking so everyone does that cognitive thinking, thinks of something good that has happened and the and the LIs, the lessons identified, and or something good that could happen and how you move towards enabling it, making it happen. So firstly, all of your team have done that thinking because they have to turn up with it done. You choose two, maybe three people at random. Um, now, actually, you can targeted choose people if you want to bring a, you know, a diverse selection of people in. But as far as the people attending know, it's you know, they don't know who's going to be chosen. And it might be that you get a great idea in that meeting. But what you will have done is you'll have gone into that meeting with everyone with their, their cognitive juices flowing. They'll be more creative, communicative, collaborative. There's a leveling exercise where so everyone feels on the same level, the same page. And here's the beauty. If you do it the following week and the next week and the next week and the next week, and we build it into routine, routines are the processes that hold our tasks and our mm -hmm. outputs together. If you build it into routine such that it becomes organizational habit, then you are getting people to scan their brains for the positives at regular periods. They will become good at it. Do not be surprised when your teams become not just good individually at it, but good at sharing it as well. So there you go. There's my second leveler and first force multiplier for you. <laughs> and, and actually, that's brilliant, Dean, because as it becomes a habit, uh, people get excited about these exercises and routines yeah. then because they want to actually, because I think as uh, human beings, uh, we love progress and we love getting good at things. And so as your brain learns to pick out, uh, as uh, you've mentioned in your example, you know, positive aspects, uh, your brain starts to really enjoy it and actually, uh, you would have your introverted people who will, who will raise their hand and say, pick me, I would like to go this week. So Absolutely. And, and, and that's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not just that we enjoy it and we value it. It's our entire um, species development has been, is based on it. If we read um, yeah. a particular he hero of mine, Barbara Fredrickson, Broaden mm -hmm. and Build Theory, yeah. those, those communities, that worked proactively and positively together that enjoyed interacting with each other their, their brains started functioning better they communicated better they learned yeah. how to communicate better they collaborated better uh, and they were more creative so uh, so they yeah. developed and it's it's a it's a basis of how we've developed and and for any good leader uh, if they're listening intently and they're listening well to the to the people in their team they would actually learn a thing or two about their team members 
and they would be able to leverage that to bring out the best in the people who are uh, around them. And and uh, yeah, and and one very quick thing that I would add is, you know, Dean, you mentioned remote working, absolutely, and this is a time where communication is something that we've we've had to adapt uh, the way we communicate. And I think, um, and this is something I think the uh, CMI CEO uh, mentioned quite early on uh, last year when we found ourselves in this situation, is communicate, but even over communicate. Let, let people know you are there and then uh, also draw out, you know, uh, uh, responses from them so engage them and i i think it is really important to uh especially encourage people who wouldn't normally come forward and be the most uh vocal uh voice in the room thank you me too um just like to take this uh this opportunity we've had some really good comments um come in and the delightfully named uh Pet Cat two four seven. Hopefully, we've managed to answer at least some of your questions that have been coming in. Um, really good comment here from Maddie Cross, who says, um, "My chief exec has been talking about turning up imperfectly rather than not at all." Um, you know, and and um, I'm presuming from that that means that we we accept that each other are imperfect as well as we are it's not a privilege only for ourselves um but you know it, it's only by kind of being willing to accept that um imperfection uh that we we can rub along uh quite nicely together absolutely uh one thing i would add to that is uh i don't think we should be equating imperfection to appropriateness i would say always be appropriate you know the way you turn up you know and um you know uh, uh you know uh, in terms of conduct etc and professionalism but uh again imperfection is sometimes self imposed as well and uh you know what are our standards of professionalism and i would say uh i wouldn't compromise those but in no way i would think that i'm perfect in every moment and in fact, um, those are some of the most, uh, uh, you know, enjoyable moments of growth when when they are uh, imperfect, because you learn so much uh, uh, in in those situations. And it also comes back to the point about uh, not having all the answers, because if we did have all the answers, uh, I think that's pretty perfect. But reality is that that's not, you know. Uh, usually the case. So I, I think we should be comfortable taking perfection out of the out of the the narrative here. Um, well, when anyone we work with, we one of the first things we do is we immediately dispel the old saying: "Practice makes people at home saying the word perfect." Mm -hmm. No, practice makes progress. Practice yeah. makes progress. Even Torval and Dean's Bolero wasn't perfect. They they were given a perfect score in the mm -hmm. Olympics and you know the gold medal. But they'll they'll tell you it was it was far from perfect. Mm -hmm. There were several mistakes in there. Um, so practice makes progress. And and a and a small health warning in here as well, which is if we're saying to people, feel free to come to work imperfect, then, then absolutely. I, I personally would take perfect out of the narrative. And I would say, you know, come to come to work hoping to make progress for yourself, for us, for everyone. But just be aware as well of presenteeism which is when people are coming to work, even though they're not in the right state of, of either physical and or mental health to be there, um, which is degrading their performance, but far more importantly, it's having a potentially a negative effect on their health, physical, mental, or both. So understand, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, understand presenteeism as an, as an equally um, an equally problematic issue as absenteeism, if not more. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, just something here, if if you don't mind, that I take because uh, I know that that Pet Cat has been putting this question in, and we've been seeking clarification about the role of equity versus equality. Um, 
and saying that within equity it's about uh, through treating people differently dependent on need and the the best piece of advice i've heard from this recently mm -hmm. is is from a, a friend of mine and fellow coach so thank you nigel who said we sh we should stop saying that we we want to treat people the way we want to be treated mm -hmm. and instead say we want to treat people in the way that they want to be treated um and that will then be based on what their individual circumstances and needs are rather than our interpretation of what we think um Absolutely. people want need have Absolutely. sure we, we should also be we should also be careful of the the allocation of our resources mm -hmm. and our resource being time energy yeah. effort particularly time because treating people equitably is making sure that we have an an equal um an equitable interest in all of them some might need more of our time at one point than another we might need more of their time their time at one point yeah. than another but we must be equitable yeah. in our approach to everyone absolutely and in fact uh funnily enough i was also going to mention time so uh and and uh, in respect of uh, giving people time, for example, uh, if you're doing that exercise uh, being that you mentioned, you know, positive aspects at the beginning of the meeting and three people bringing that, you know, so actually giving people uh, who most need to actually have their voice heard the time to engage in that exercise. So it's also about allocating people the time and and the chance to to um, to to take center stage from time to time. Yeah, and that can can be as simple as you know if you're running a meeting, actively inviting those individuals to speak, and um, being mm -hmm. aware that you know they've got something that's worth listening to, but they're they're less pushy, um, they're less concerned with taking up the bandwidth. Um, and if you don't create that opportunity right at the beginning, they, they might get lost. So um, final question coming from the audience. Um, and it links with one we were looking at before. So, so just things uh, moving forward. Um, so, you know, when we think of kind of the, the key tactics that one can take forward to influence that, why? into how and making that how sustainable um you know just briefly if people would go away with one or two things from you today what would you want them to take away read to please sure so i'll i'll keep it really brief um i would say start walking the talk stop making excuses and continue having these conversations and um, for you dino building on what ritu said don't be frightened to be a positive outlier don't be frightened to be the first light that shines beyond the current boundary of light don't be frightened to step and be identified as that positive outlier because you've been recruited based on what you have to bring to the organization so don't be frightened to show that and it's the organization's responsibility to make you feel that what you think and what you do matter matters by recognizing that you're putting yourself out there you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position that that's that lone light in a certain respect identifying how we could do something differently how we start meetings um and and then they should back you that they must back you it's not about just advocating it's about championing absolutely and uh, just to add to that, Dean, as you say, you know, you own it, you be it, and and then you share it, and I think that's <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like someone's been in another talk um, <laughs> last week. Yeah. So so thank you both um very much for your uh, uh, perspective and considered advice. But before um we hand back to Jamil. Um, today, I'd, I'd like to kind of give something for people to, to think about on this theme of being a candle in the darkness. Um, so Dean will understand this. You know, one of the ways when we're out in some of the nastier places in, in the world, um, 
uh, and we have to shine a light. One of the ways we can measure light is in terms of candle power. So the number of single candles a light is equivalent to. And if you've got enough candle power, um, then you can pierce the darkness. You can shine it into the corners. You can uh, get light through the fog, the dust, the dark. Um, so, so what I want really is for people to consider um, be one candle that's part of many. Um, pierce the darkness wherever it is. Um, and for yourself and for everyone around you, don't be afraid of the dark. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So that's it for this evening's session. Thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening, and especially thanks to Steve, to Dean, and to Ritu for sharing your insights and your expertise this evening with us all. It's been immensely valuable. If you're a member of CMI, you can log into Management Direct using the link in the live chat box, and you can, there you can find thousands of exclusive practical development resources and much, much more. And if you've not yet subscribed, why not join our community via the link that's also in the live chat to gain full access to our Management Direct portal. And you can also sign up for the free CMI newsletter. And plus also in the live chat, there's a link where you can visit and um, find out more about the CMI Southeast Regional Board. And from there, you can also connect with the board's LinkedIn group to continue the discussion and to network. So thank you once again to everyone who's joined us this evening. Thank you to our speakers and please do enjoy the rest of your evenings.